Well, <laughs> as we begin this series on a more serious note, I want to ask you one question. There's two questions that I want to ask. But the first, as we start, what, what is your view of women? Now, I'm sure you have some conscious thoughts. I'm sure, there's, if we dive a little deeper, you probably have some unconscious thoughts. But what is your view of women? You know, it's, it's something we, we don't often talk about. But right here at the start of, of this series, I want to ask you, what is your view of women? For you ladies in the house, what is your view of yourself? What is your view of the women around you? What are the adjectives that come to mind? What are the stereotypes that are playing in the background of your thoughts and in your life? What's our view, male and female, brothers and sisters? What's our view of the women based on church culture? Uh, and, and to be honest, this is an intimidating subject to, <laughs> to talk about in today's culture. But, um, you know, we, as your pastors, we just, we just want to be up front and we want to speak honestly about what we feel the Bible has to say about the matter. So the second question is, What's God's view of women? Hmm. We have to know what God is thinking in order so we can conform to his image, right? So Paige and I are going to ask these questions throughout this series and throughout this month. What is God's view of women? What is his plan for them? What is his design? What was his original design? Because it was God in the garden that made male and female, right? Mm -hmm. Not just male, he created male and female actually to represent him and to reflect him in the earth. And there's often this distance between, you know, our view of women and then God's view of women. And so as we discuss this topic over this next week, our prayer is that that those views will eventually become closer and closer. And ultimately, we would all submit our view of women to God, our preconceived notions, our, our life experiences, our stereotypes. We've all had different experiences with the women in our lives, whether they were a very strong woman in the home, or maybe you didn't even have a mother that you grew up with. Maybe your mother abandoned you at an early age, or maybe you're in a relationship with, with a, a very dominant man in the house. And so you don't feel like maybe you have a voice. What is God's view of women? We'll walk it out in this series. And I hope you'll, at the end of it, you'll be encouraged. Amen? Amen. You know, the foundation that we want to build upon throughout this series is this. That Jesus and his kingdom changes everything. And you know this, if you're a part of Liberty, you remember last year we did the Uncommon series. Because of Jesus, we are called to live our life uncommon. He says we repay evil with good. Well, that's uncommon. So Jesus and his kingdom changes everything. And this is what Jesus has come to do. He's not come to just give us a clearer view of men or a clearer view of women. He has come to give us a clearer view of his kingdom of heaven coming here to earth. And so the scripture we want to start out with is found in Galatians chapter 3, Galatians 3 verses 27 and 28. I'm reading it out of the Passion Translation and it says this, it was faith that immersed you into Jesus, the anointed one, and now you are covered and clothed with his anointing. So it was faith. You're saved by grace through faith. And we no longer see each other in our former state, Jew or non-Jew, rich or poor, male or female, because we're all one through our union with Jesus Christ. And there's no distinction between us. So this book of Galatians, it was written to Christians who were turning away from their faith. And so the apostle Paul, he's encouraging them to change their perspective, to to shift in the way that they view one another, no longer to see each other according to their previous state. And really, It's giving us a clearer view of the way that we should operate in our current worlds because our relationship with Christ, it affects the way that we treat one another. It affects the way that, that we see one another. And specifically throughout scripture, Jesus was doing something dynamic when it came to women. 
He was doing something that 2,000 years ago in their cultural context, and we'll get to that more, but he, he was doing something back then. And I believe he's still doing something today. And so yeah. right now we've got a lot of scripture that we're going to get into, but we wanted you to kind of know where we're going and know what we're talking about and why it is so important for us all. Because here's the thing, our enemy, your enemy, yeah. he has claimed a lot of rightfully purchased ground specific to this area. Yeah. And it has kept women in bondage which women are the heartbeat of your home. And if the women are in bondage, then you know what? It, it, in turn, it ripple effect. It never starts with you. It never stops with you. It goes on. And so today we're going to try to get going on this because this is ground that we believe as the church, we are called to reclaim as men and women through our relationship with Jesus Christ. That's right. And, and the area of men and women, the, the dignity of women, the ministry of women, the, the cultural norm of women. Jesus came and he purchased all of that at the cross. He is resurrected now. Hallelujah. And, and <laughs> now he gives the church the opportunity to reclaim what the enemy has stolen. And I've just decided that we are not going to allow Satan to have any more ground yeah. Come on. that Jesus spilled his blood Come to on. purchase us for. Amen. Amen. So we're going to be wildly biblical, and you're going to hear probably more scripture in this series than you might think or want. <laughs> but that being said, let's, let's just jump right in, okay? In Hebrews 1 is where we're going to start. Hebrews 1, verse 1 through 3, and it says, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in, the, in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He, being Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. That's important. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. So there's something for us to learn from the life, the ministry, the example of Jesus Christ. God is trying desperately to get his message across to the entire world. And he wants us to be so clear about this that, that he put all of his exact nature mm -hmm. in his son, Jesus Christ. He's communicating to you and me that there's something for us to learn here. And, and that's not the only place that we see it. In, in the New Testament, there's, there's the same language that Paul uses over in Colossians 1, verse 15. Again, Colossians 1, verse 15, he says, He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. So if you want to know what God is like, you've got to put your eyes on his son. He's the image of the invisible God. Yeah. Later on in that chapter, verse 19, it says, For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Wow. God was pleased to dwell in his son. Think about that. It's mind-blowing, right? The fullness of God was pleased to dwell in Jesus. So here's the point I want to get across. If you want to know what God is like, we look at Jesus. Jesus. And this is huge. If, if you want to know what the nature of God is like, maybe you've wondered, is, is God distant? Is he really a loving God? You want to know how God interacts with culture, how God handles the political environment, the relational things, the relationship between a man and a woman, between friends in life. If you want to know what God is like, then we look to Jesus. So as it relates to this series, if we want to know what and how God views women, then we look at Jesus. Jesus is our tuning fork, if you will. He, he causes us to, to correct mm -hmm. our, our attitudes, our, our impressions from time to time. And you're going to see again and again in Scripture so many interactions between Jesus and women, which in turn should cause us to calibrate to Christ. 
big. Years ago, um, in 1997, there was a movie called Men in Black. Did anybody see that? Here come the men in black. I don't, I'm not sure. I can't, it's been a long time since I've seen it, so I can't qualify if it's good or bad, but I'm sure it's going to get a lot of hits on Netflix today. So anyways, there was this movie. Tommy Lee Jones and Will Smith were there, and obviously they were dressed in black. And they were a part of this government agency, and their job was to keep the aliens away from the normal people. And they had this little tool called a neuralizer. (laughs) We have one. And if you had interacted with... (laughs) an alien, the men in black would show up and they would do an investigation and you would look at the flashing red light. Uh-huh. Get it out, babe. And it would erase your memory. And so right here at the beginning of this series, for some of you, you may need a red flashing light neuralizer moment when it comes to women mm-hmm. and Jesus. We got to calibrate to Christ. Amen. That's the missing piece, is a recalibration, not to, you know, let's not let our culture be louder than Christ. Let's not let our own feelings or our past experiences be louder than Christ. Let's calibrate to Christ. And what does calibration mean? A lot of you uh, out there may have worked with instrumentation that has to be calibrated from time to time because just over time it gets off. Mm -hmm. So it has to be reset. And calibration just means to a resetting uh, back to a standard. We come back to a a true line, like a true north and compass land. So that's what we're doing is recalibrating. I like it. So today we're going to go to the very first interaction that Jesus has with a woman. And I know it's the beginning of October, but we're going to talk about Mary, Mary, the mother of Jesus. And so if we're going to calibrate to Christ, what can we learn through this interaction? Because here's the question that we're trying to ask. What is Jesus saying to us, to each one of us, male and female, through choosing women? If we believe that God is sovereign, we do, right? We believe that God has a plan. He's not just shooting from the hip. If we believe that there is a design and a purpose for every single thing, then we have to believe that God has a reason that he chose a woman to play such a massive role in his redemptive story. So would you read that story, baby? Sure. It's found in Luke chapter 1, verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So much is going on in this story, but the bottom line, the bottom points to what Jesus Christ is doing. And I don't know if you caught it. It says his kingdom will have no end. He is bringing a new kingdom. He's not starting a new religion. He's not kicking off a Christian club for the Sunday morning crew. He is bringing a kingdom and he is going to reign over this kingdom. Now, I don't know if you enjoy puzzles. 
I love puzzles. And uh, one of the most frustrating things about a puzzle is if you miss a piece. Yeah. We have um, two dogs at our house and our blonde um, golden doodle, Sadie, she is notorious if I leave my puzzle unattended, she likes to come by and just eat a couple of random pieces <laughs> that I don't know have been gone until I'm struggling trying to find the missing piece. But the most important piece of the puzzle, I believe, is the picture on the box. Because if you don't know what the big picture looks like, there is no way you're going to be able to put all these pieces in the appropriate place. And when it comes to this understanding of what God is doing, I believe one of the reasons that we struggle so much is we are trying to fit the pieces into the wrong places based on our own personal experiences, maybe a previously held theology, maybe a specific belief in regards to the church. And we see the puzzle piece, we see it, but yet we're so desperately trying by our feelings and our lived experiences to push it in. And what we're asking you to do through this series is to erase all of that and just catch the picture on the front of the box. Yeah. What we are seeing here in this first interaction with Jesus and this first woman that Jesus interacts with, which happens to be his mom, is God is showing us the front of the box. He's showing us his target. His target is a new kingdom. Amen. So let's back up for a moment and let's look at that bigger picture of what God is doing here on the earth. What is he doing? He was creating a kingdom. Yeah. <clears throat> Genesis 1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He was creating a new kingdom. You see, both Adam and Eve were significant. Yeah. Both of them. Genesis 1, 27, it says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female created them. We are created in his likeness, in his image, male and female. No other creation gets this privilege. Yeah. So what are we talking about when we talk about men and women? Well, we're talking about kingdom men yeah. and kingdom women. And the reputation of the God of the Bible is that he's setting up his kingdom here on earth. What we can miss is that if we only aim at women then we end up in this ditch called feminism. But if we only aim at men on the other side, then we'll end up in this ditch called chauvinism. And, and what we must do is, is calibrate to Christ. Yeah. Yeah. He is our standard. Yeah. Yeah. Who ultimately gave up his rights and sacrificed himself and went to the cross for us all. Yeah. He was resurrected on the third day. And he would inaugurate a new kingdom where the role of men and women was like that of Adam and Eve, but better. Yeah. And yeah. in this new Jerusalem, in the end, we're going to see all the sons of Adam and all the daughters of Eve made right Amen. and new in Christ, bearing his image. And we're going to talk about this in the upcoming weeks. That's right. That, that's what the front of the puzzle box looks like. When Jesus shows up in Mary's world, he's coming to build a new kingdom. And if we can hold this picture in our mind, then we're going to appropriately deal with this conversation, with every piece of the puzzle. Because really, this is a conversation about God. The conversation about women, it's really a conversation about God. The conversation about honoring women, it's really a conversation about honoring God, whose image they bear. Yeah. And that's what we're talking about. We are not trying to be progressive. We are not woke. We ain't no nary a woke one, one of us up in here. Okay. Our intention is to be wildly biblical. That's right. And so what you've got to understand is when Jesus showed up, what did Mary do? If you were to continue reading, it goes into Mary's song, the Magnificon. It said she magnified the Lord. And that's yeah. our response. When we calibrate to Christ, it causes us to magnify God. She said yes to carrying the word of God in her heart and in her life. She said, yes, I will receive this word and I will magnify God. Well, what does that word magnify mean? We all think of a magnifying glass or maybe we recall that the, 
the biology class in, in school <laughs> where we'd slide the little glass under there and then the magnifying glass would magnify it mm-hmm. over a hundred times. Or maybe you've used that GPS app on your, your phone or, or your computer and you were able to zoom in to, to one little area. And, and it's not that we make God any bigger. Can we make God bigger than he already? He's infinitely, eternally yeah. big. It's not that we make him bigger, but by choosing to magnify him, what do we do? We give him a larger proportion yeah. of our lives, of our, our screen. So when we zoom in on that map, on the computer, it's not that, that that little dot that used to be there now has detail and now has, we've somehow made it bigger. We've just zoomed in on it. We've mm-hmm. focused on it and yeah. we've given it a larger proportion of our screen, of our time, of our, our lives, of our relationships, of our marriage. And when you start to magnify God, you're going to stand out in culture <laughs> because we're going to start looking different than yeah. everybody else. Yeah. And Mary said yes, but that didn't mean it was going to be easy for her. Right. This was going to be a very hard road. I mean, eventually she would be walking down the road and it would be pretty obvious that she was pregnant. That and not married. And not married. And that was grounds for being stoned back then as mm-hmm. a woman, mm-hmm. having children out of marriage. But she said yes. Yeah. yeah. She chose the hard road. Yeah. And this is a massive shift that Jesus Christ did that he doesn't get enough credit for. Jesus moved women from a commodity to a co-heir status. That's huge. That's huge. He did. And in this series, we're going to show you through Scripture that Jesus was the most pro-woman leader in human history, especially when these words were spoken over 2,000 years ago. When Jesus Christ showed up, he showed up to a cultural context where women were owned. Mm -hmm. Marriages were arranged at best. And in the Roman and Greek culture where this was happening, you could literally kill a woman. You could beat her for whatever reason. And there was no law saying you couldn't. Mm -hmm. Little girls as young as five, six, seven years old were sold. If a family didn't have the means to pay for something, they could sell their daughter to pay their debt because that was really the value that they had. Sex trafficking is not a new thing. It was going on thousands of years ago. And it is into this. Women were considered a partial person at best. And worse, they were like the bottom of the barrel, like they were just traded like oxen or a horse would be. And it's into this space that Jesus Christ shows up changes the way that women are viewed forever. And I think we don't give him enough credit because oftentimes we've given the church a black eye and say inappropriately that the church is holding women back. Mm. Again, when there are atheists in the world who don't even believe that Jesus is Lord, but they would say and testify that, that this man, Jesus Christ, who walked the earth, he changed everything for women and children specifically. Yeah. And really, it's apologetic the way the women have been treated. And it mattered tremendously to Jesus. And I think it's crazy because we tend to read the scriptures through our 2022 view. And we're not really getting what Jesus did. But each one of these guys who wrote the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these men, every single one of them dignified and honored and held women in high regard. You can see it through their documentation of the encounters that they have with Jesus. Yeah, and this would have been totally countercultural for their day. And we miss this because we're living here in America, 2,000 years removed mm-hmm. from all that happened in Jesus' day. And we're really living in the benefits downstream yeah. of, of the cultural uh, revolution that happened, that Jesus brought about. Um, through his message. And we want to challenge you today to look again at at the church, at culture, and and how this resurrection of Christ, the ascension of Christ, what was birthed out of that, how we walked forward, taking the lead from Jesus, seeing and doing very different things in their culture And what we're doing is we're asking you to take all your preconceived notions for for just briefly this morning, put them in a box, and let's just push them aside. Let's allow God 
to, to set a new table of, of our views, of, of our feelings, of, of our uh, belief systems, and let's recalibrate back to Jesus. And there's a whole lot of significant first that actually came out of this time period. And we see this in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And, and it's looking at the big picture, mm-hmm. that image on the front of the puzzle box. And, and that's what you need to understand. He is, he's building a kingdom of God. And the four Gospels, these are like those four corner pieces of our puzzle. They're important. Very important. And, and if you've ever done puzzles, you usually go for those corner pieces and those, those flat ones, right? And, and you set up your, your outer boundaries. And that's what we're tr- doing this morning. We're setting up some very specific and strategic boundary lines, mm-hmm. and then we're going to fill in the gaps mm-hmm. uh, in, in our message this morning and throughout the, the weeks to come. But we're, we're viewing our role and the view of women or maybe you're a woman or a man, and we're trying to raise and honor and encourage the women around us. Yeah. The Gospels hold up this unbelievable countercultural view. And now, as Jesus has said, a co-heir in the kingdom of God. Think about this. What we don't realize is that the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they weren't written right after Jesus yeah. Yeah. was killed. It was later. Years later. Yeah. Years yeah. later. It was like they, they had this reunion. They get back together and they start <laughs> reminiscing. They're like, oh, I forgot about that. Let me write that down. Yeah. They, they were in retrospect and, and the disciples go to a very, they're very intentional about how Jesus mm-hmm. treated women. Mm-hmm. And he has ascended to heaven and, and now they're talking about all this the details, and they're starting to make sense. Mm -hmm. They're starting to put those pieces together, what Christ did in the lives and the roles of women. Yeah, and the very first person that Jesus even shares with and tells them that he's the Messiah was a woman. Yeah. It's in John chapter 4. Preston's going to preach about this next week. You don't want to miss that. But here's the thing. It wasn't even a Jewish woman. It was someone who in her day would have been considered an outcast. It was a Samaritan woman at lunchtime out by the well. And she wasn't his only first. Again, Jesus would invite a couple of sisters, Mary and Martha, to be a part of his crew, to be in his inner circle. You you find it in Luke chapter 10 when Martha is serving. Um, All the disciples are with Jesus sitting at his feet, and Mary is sitting at his feet with the disciples. That's important because that meant she was in the boys part of the house. She was sitting at his feet as if she were a teacher and he was teaching her. This is big stuff. And Mary is there and Martha comes to Christ and she's like, hey, Jesus, would you go ahead and speak up to my sister? She needs to go and jump up here and help me fill these glasses of water. Serve these food. But Jesus doesn't do that. And I think most of us have heard this story, and yet we miss the significance of what is happening. Because what Christ has done in this moment is he has invited her to take the actual seat that Mary had chosen, the better way of a disciple. Trisha spoke about this in great detail on Wednesday night. You can go back and look at that on our online platforms. But this was completely unheard of in the Jewish context. Even today, if you go to Israel, you go to the Western Wall, which is one of the most holiest places where they're praying, the men and the women are separate. Mm -hmm. They're not together. But Jesus comes and he says, learn at my feet, Mary. Martha, why don't you take the path that your sister has taken? It's the better place to be. Yeah, and I'm sure among the craziness of that night in the Garden of Gethsemane, when all of this was going down, when Jesus was being arrested, and the disciples start recounting that, (laughs) they're like, where were you when all this, it's kind of like 9-11, where were you when Mm -hmm, that happened? mm -hmm. And, And the disciples are asking, well, I was there until Peter cut that guy's ear off, and I was out. And the other guy's like, well, I was there, and I saw him actually put it back on. And then, then I got scared, and I left. And then Peter speaks up, and he says, well, I actually followed as far as Caiaphas' house, where they were trying him, and, and until th- I was recognized. And, and I feared for my life, and I denied him three times, just like he said that mm-hmm. I would. Mm-hmm. And then I left in shame. 
and they start comparing these notes. And, and then they were like, well, who was actually, who stayed with him until the time that he was crucified? And, and it was like, from deduction, they were like, well, I guess it was the women. They stuck around. They stuck it out. They were there with him at his death. And they could have been there, but the Bible wasn't specific. They, they do call out and they say that John, John? was there. Mm-hmm. And, um, but, but we know that the women were there, right? So it's very significant how Jesus dealt with women. And so we come to the same conclusion that, that the role of women was very important in his day. Jesus is reclaiming ground that the culture had suppressed. Yeah, yeah. They had been made a commodity. They had said, buy, use, sell them as you will, dispose of them. And Jesus said that this is not the creation that I made. This is not how we intended in the garden. I made male and female to bear my image, to reflect me on the earth. So one of the massive ways that Jesus Christ will bring the kingdom of heaven, even now, if he looks maybe at at you, sister, and he says, how are you going to treat the women around you? He says, hey, you, brother, how are you going to honor the women in your life? This is very significant. And in 1 Peter 3, 7, it says, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Yeah. You see this? Husbands, don't treat your wives like the rest of the world. Honor them. Honor them. So one of the things that the church was famous for after Christ was the way that they actually treated women. So this is why women actually ran to the ecclesia. This was the gathering of Mm -hmm. the church Mm -hmm. because they had never been treated the way that they were being treated in the church. This is why in the book of Acts is full of women who started coming to the people of God because they were, the men were treating them different. The other women were actually treating them different. That's right. This is why today in our world, you can look around and see in our Westernized culture, we are living in the stream of what Christ did 2,000 years ago. Listen, we're not perfect. We don't get it right all the time. But that's why today in parts of the world that we might be unfamiliar with, where women are still treated as commodities, women have become the strength of the fastest growing churches in both Iran and in other Middle Eastern spaces where the primary way that they would be treated in their culture is less than. Jesus Christ has done something specific with how we should treat one another. And it matters to us how we do that. He has moved women from a commodity to a co-heir. He's changed everything. And it matters. Yes. And as we close today, we're going to continue in worship together. We've got another song, and then we're going to take communion as a family. And what I would ask each of you is to just begin to evaluate in your own hearts, in light of this message, what is God saying to me? What do I need to actually do about it? Husbands, maybe it will cause you to celebrate all that God has put inside of your wife and encourage her to grow in those. Single guys, maybe it will change the way you're dating. Maybe it will change the way all of us men view the images that we see on the internet. Maybe I need to speak differently to the women in my life. If you're a lady in the room, maybe you just need to walk out of the space where you have felt like a commodity. Maybe you're coming out of a tough relationship. Maybe the way people have spoken to you has caused you to believe a lie about yourself, that you're not enough. And now it's time for you to walk in your identity as a co-heir with Christ. We've been talking about identity all year. This is just a continuation of that identity in Christ that we need to find So Paige is going to pray, and then we'll get ready to worship and receive communion together. 
Would you bow your heads as we pray? Father God, we thank you for your church. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would continue to move and fill this room with your presence. You've been speaking to our hearts now, Lord, and we ask that we would not just be hearers of the word, but that we would be doers of the word. Let us see, Jesus, that you changed everything so that, number one, if we're a woman, we could see ourselves rightly and the value that we have in you. If we're a man, that we would treat the women in our lives appropriately. Father, would you change our habits? Would you change our words? Would you change our attitudes? God, create in us a clean heart and renew a right spirit within us. May the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. We ask that you would continue to mold us and make us into your image. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.